I think the promotional video speaks for itself, uh, but we've recently launched a recent uh, edited volume, which was edited by one of my very talented colleagues, Ritika Passi, who is also in the room. Uh, and there will be some copies available outside after this session, so please do pick them up. Uh, there's also some available which, uh, outside, but it's also available online if there aren't enough copies. So please do pick it up and have a look online. If I could please request the panelists to take the stage. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the last panel discussion of the evening, so thank you all for staying. Uh, this conversation is called Out of Africa, Green Growth and Development. So I'm joined by an excellent panel of speakers. We have Gwendolyn Abuna, who is the Managing Director of EcoBank. We have Miriam Yanusa, the Principal Economist of the African Development Bank. We have Mohua Mukherjee, the Pro uh, Program Ambassador for the International Solar Alliance. We have Monali Ratsoma, who's the Director General for the New Development Bank, and we have Kwame Awino, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the Institute of Economic Affairs. So just as a means of an introduction, the African continent has the fastest growing young population in the world, considerable natural resources, and a huge potential as growth's new frontier. And many of the countries in Africa are already um, in the midst of rapid economic growth and industrialization. While economic expansion is an imperative, it is also evident that Africa will not follow traditional pathways for growth and development that were based on reckless models of carbon consumption. How can Africa become a leader in a low carbon transition while ensuring that it continues to raise development standards? And what can new development cooperation models offer in terms of improved flows of technology and finance? On this panel, we'll discuss how the international community must come together to catalyze greater financing and access to technology, and how the private sector can partner with communities uh, to achieve sustainable industrialization. So some of the key questions that we'll discuss include how can we leverage and truly unleash the potential of the continent in a sustainable ma manner, <coughs> excuse me, and what role can and should various actors such as multilateral development banks and international government organizations play. So, Gwendolyn, I'd like to turn to you first. Uh, many African economies are outpacing their peers in terms of growth. What is driving this growth, and is it sustainable? And which countries and which sectors do you see as bright spots in Africa in which they can lead? Thank you, Terry. Um, I would like to start by saying, you know, um, when I see myself on a panel about green growth and development, and I'm a banker, I had a lot of questions for myself um, in view of what can we do in our economies to actually promote green growth and development, and is it sustainable? You know, um, when you talk about green growth, you talk about sustainable development, and you talk about green economies, and you find yourself asking the question, how can we actually have growth in income and employment with public and private partnership? And the question comes about by saying that the larger and the richer countries can talk about green growth because they have gone through industrialization. They are at a point where it is feasible for them to talk about being green. But we have developed countries like some of ours where most of the natural resources that we have are actually export proceeds for the countries. So can we make them green and can we make them green now? Um, that does not mean that there's no potential. What it means is that the focus right now might not be on going green. It might be, as the minister said this morning, on creating wealth. Let me not use the word alleviating poverty. So I believe that if you look at the 54 African countries, the vast majority of them still have a lot of potential in terms of growth. But we have to find 
each and everyone's purpose and agenda to say, what does Cameroon need? What does a Gabon need? Versus what does a Kenya or a South Africa need in terms of growth potential in Africa? Great, thank you. Uh, Miriam, I'll turn to you now. What about multilateral development banks? How do you think that the African Development Bank can help ensure sustainable economic growth for Africa? And how successful is the bank in raising capital for areas and sectors that need it most? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, I think maybe to take a step back, so let's look at what sectors are actually driving the growth in Africa. I mean, Africa has probably, you know, the fastest growing economies globally. And a lot of it is being driven by the agriculture sector and by agro-based and commodity-based industrialization. So while the, a lot of the uh, countries across the world are looking towards the fourth industrial revolution, we need to kind of acknowledge the fact that Africa is probably the only continent that has not yet experienced a green revolution. And the African Development Bank is doing a lot of work, of course, with the, all the other um, you know, uh, pan-African institutions, including the, uh, the African Union and national governments, really, to make sure that we unleash that capacity of Africa to, to feed itself. And why is this critical? It's critical because agriculture is so central. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you here are sitting and thinking, gosh, when is this panel going to end so we can go for dinner? You know, having the ability to feed yourself and to be self-sufficient in food is critical. Africa has not yet been able to achieve that despite the gains that we have, you know, been able to record over the past uh, 50 years after independence. You know, currently Africa imports up to, you know, upwards of $40 billion worth of food. And if we don't do anything, this is likely to grow to, you know, over 100 billion by the year 2025. So I think it, it, it gives us a lot of opportunities and challenges that I think we should be able to sort of address in very critical manners. I think it gives us the opportunity to, to leapfrog, especially when we look at the interaction between the agriculture sector industry and climate change. It's very interesting to note that uh, the agriculture sector actually contributes 35% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now, if you look at it on the reverse side, the effect of climate change on the agriculture sector, particularly in Africa, is so detrimental, particularly because Africa is so focused on subsistence and rain-fed agriculture. So when um, we at the African Development Bank try to look at how we're going to address this, I think our focus has really been on how do we leverage the concessional resources that we have in order to bring in the private sector. Africa only receives 4% of private climate change financing, and that's minuscule. We won't be able to do anything with it. Now, the only solution going forward is really to be able to bring in the private sector, to bring in commercial banks. And the, 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 key, you know, the key element in that is really how do we make sure that this perception of Africa being so risky is addressed. And I think the African Development Bank, of course, has focused a lot on trying to build in de-risking uh, facilities that will allow the private sector to really come in in full force and make sure that the development pathway that we come up with is one, green, is two, sustainable, is three, inclusive, but mainly private sector driven and public sector enabled. Absolutely, great. Uh, Mohua. What role can international organizations such as the International Solar Alliance play in catalyzing Africa's low carbon transitions? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I'd like to get to the International Solar Alliance's role um, after just making a couple of points in terms of terminology so that it makes sense uh, what I'm going to say. I think that it's really important for people who are not um, dealing with the clean energy sector day to day, to just keep a few things in mind. Um, first of all, we have a clean energy transition that in one uh, respect talks about generating very large grid scale um, projects of solar and wind to feed into the electricity grid. Now in South Asia, a lot of the countries have about an 80% grid coverage, between 70 and 80% of the population is connected to the grid. It may not be reliable, but there's a very high network already. In many African countries, um, which are large and which have uh, rather low population density outside of the megacities, 
uh, the grid coverage is probably in the 20% range. So there's going to be a different solution when you are generating large amounts of solar and wind to feed into the grid. In African countries with a low rate of grid coverage, it's going to reach fewer people. So you actually need to find off-grid solutions in African countries because it won't be the same as you have when you already have the grid covering 80%. So that's one just marker I'd like to put, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, another thing is the energy spend. In uh, South Asian countries, um, the kerosene and diesel used to be subsidized until about 2014-15. So because it was subsidized, people's monthly energy spend was rather low. They were buying kerosene and diesel for their energy needs, but they were spending a little amount of money because it was subsidized. In a lot of African countries, there was not this kind of subsidy. So for example, in India, people may have been spending one or two dollars a month, um, whereas in Africa, in East Africa, I know the figures, they were, it was more like between 11 and 15 dollars a month. So where does the private sector want to go? When the private sector says, hmm, I'm coming along with a solution that will be cheaper than whatever you're spending now, which is why you're going to go for my solution, they will go to the part of the world that has a bigger energy wallet they would like to go and serve people who are spending 11 and $15 a month and give them a $10 solution rather than going to somebody who was only spending $1.50 and then you really have to come in like at less than a dollar in order to attract them to your clean energy solution. So again, that's another marker I just want to put and I'll come back to in a minute. So this um, business of grid coverage and your original energy spend and your energy wallet are, are important factors to consider in the energy transition strategy. There's another point which is um, that you reduce, I mean our two previous speakers have spoken about risk perceptions um, and the use of green climate fund money and other uh, climate finance to offset some of the risk and to bring in uh, other capital because the sector obviously needs capital. So I just want to put in another sort of marker, which is that just like imagine mixing paint in a big bucket. So you, you mix red and blue and you get purple and you keep stirring it around like that. We will mix different what we call colors of money. So we will have one color which is grant money, outright grant. And then we will mix that with some concessional money, which is like African Development Bank, World Bank, New Development Bank. That is long-term low interest rate, not grant, but a different kind of terms and conditions, definitely not private sector. So we've mixed those two into the bucket and we are stirring. And then we come with the commercial uh, rates, your uh, Ecobank and other banks like yours, which have market rates and their term of lending is much shorter. So what are we doing when we create a blend of all this finance is that we ultimately come up with a package of funding that has a lower interest rate and a longer maturity than we would if we just used private commercial money alone. We're diluting your terms with this other things and that's blended finance. So um, again, I wanna plant this maybe in your second round, I'll come back and say you know, what, how we can use all of these to craft our solutions. The International Solar Alliance, coming to the point that you uh, wanted me to address, is actually running um, different programs. One is the agricultural sector, looking at uh, solar pumping, irrigation pumps, uh, is one very important productive use where a lot of farmers who do use irrigation are using diesel, at least in India. Um, a lot of pumping is done by diesel but the majority of the pumps in India are connected to a separate electricity line that has been built for them. And due to various political pressures and so forth, in most states, farmers pay nothing for the electricity that they use for their pumping. So this creates a tremendous need for subsidy and it messes with the finances of the electric utility. So one of the major 
thrusts of the uh, International Solar Alliance, also of the Indian government, and the revealed demand from many African countries is help us to get pumps that are powered by solar energy so that we don't use diesel, we don't use free electricity, and we actually give control to the farmers. So one of the programs is solar electricity. Another one is rooftop solar that the International Solar Alliance is looking at. Uh, rooftop solar, the president of, uh, former president of Maldives had mentioned earlier today that um, you have solar panels connected to the grid. So if you as a private investor, private uh, customer, invest in solar panels on your own roof, you're paying for them and you're generating the energy, you're consuming it during the daytime, you need to remain connected to the grid because at night your solar panels won't work. So your nighttime electricity you have to buy from the grid. But the idea of net metering, which he was talking about, is that when you generate more in the daytime than you use, you sell it to the electric company via the grid. So they pay you for the surplus that you generate and don't consume. And therefore, you get an offset in your electricity bill. You generate, suppose you use, you're going to consume 100 units. You generate 80 units. So you only pay them for 20 units uh, instead of what you previously used to pay them for the full 100 that you used to buy from them. Now you're getting a credit for the surplus that um, you're generating. So that's the second program of the International Solar Alliance. Um, there's, uh, there are other programs as well. Um, I, I won't go through, I don't have time to go through all of them, but let me mention capacity building. Uh, capacity building is tremendously important. The Solar Alliance is trying to set up centers of excellence um, all over Africa. And any kind of capacity building of which, you know, there's a big partnership with um, Megan Fallon's uh, Barefoot College, uh, this Solar Mamas, who are, uh, which is capacity building at the absolute grassroots level, training uh, women to basically produce and assemble solar lamps and how to fix them, troubleshoot, go back and set up businesses. So for all the way from that to a mid-career professional master's degree level course, there's a whole range of capacity building that the Solar Alliance is also doing. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Could you give us some context on the New Development Bank? And does the bank have plans to increase its membership and invest in countries outside of the, the BRICS members? Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, and yes, I mean, perhaps let me begin with introducing the bank. Uh, yes, the bank is fully operational. Uh, as of uh, last week, we have close to $9 billion already committed. Um, the, the political principles that established the bank, they had one real goal in mind, uh, which was to develop an institution that is not premised on the template of the traditional Bretton Woods systems. And I'll tell you why I say that. Um, because as, 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 as part of the core mandate of the bank is that there is going to be a preservation of uh, sovereignty uh, across member countries. There was a line earlier on that came through that made reference to some members within BRICS that perhaps may be smaller than others, uh, perhaps insignificant. The basis of which the bank is, is structured is that uh, there's, there's equity across. Uh, no member has got any veto power over, over any other. Um, there's equitable contribution. So my dollar is just as uh, equally valued as your, as your dollar as a member, which I think is a fundamental principle of having to, to, principle of having to depart away from the traditional uh, Bretton Woods systems in the way that they operated. Also within that is a move away from having to impose on what member countries should do and should not do. Um, so we, the underpin on how we approach project is that uh, we use country systems across procurement, um, across uh, ENS, uh, and so forth. And of course, within, within reason, that we, we have to sit and agree 
uh, agri uh, parameters. I think that's the essence of why a bank like the NDB uh, has made sense in the way that it has made sense and it has been, to prog has been able to progress uh, in the way that it has, uh, it has progressed. The other principle, in fact, that is also quite key and we've been moving quite fast in, in, in the last few months is the focus on local currency. Uh, and of course, I think a big element of that comes in, the, in, in or the sense of it is that uh, the country's revenues are in local currency. Uh, and in many instances, countries tend to end up battling with uh, servicing FX debt. Uh, and therefore, it makes sense that uh, if we are to come up with new ways of doing uh, infrastructure, we focus on having to uh, finance infrastructure in member countries in their own local currency where their uh, fiscal re revenues are, are, are generated. Uh, and, we, and we go further, in fact, in trying to think about uh, what the, the green economies would look like, uh, given the emphasis on developing uh, economies and, and how quickly uh, we need to be you know, adapting our economies. And the key um, input there would be how we find ways and mechanisms to manage the transitions. Uh, many of the developing economies have got abundance still and if you to look at just within, within the five member countries, three at least are still very much uh, dependent on coal as a source of, uh, source of power. Uh, and for many years to come, that is still going to be the case. And I'll make an example of South Africa and how we, we look to contribute as a bank in managing those transitions. Um, ESCOM, which is a large utility in, in South Africa providing, providing power, has been building new, uh, two new large coal-fired uh, power, power plants. So we can step aside and say we're not going to be part of the, the conversation as, as a bank. Uh, then, of course, then we'll be departing from what we are defining as a niche. Rather than stepping aside, we're coming in to say that we may finance um, uh, technology that reverses the emission that is, uh, that is, that is coming out of the, uh, the, the power plant. So, for instance, we are financing a flue gas desulfurization, which in itself uh, looks to, 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 to reverse some of the emissions. And we, Increasingly, when we're talking about coal, uh, we're thinking about ultra-critical technologies that as a bank we can finance if, if they emerge, which really makes, makes a lot of sense if we're defining uh, the value that the NDB uh, as a proposition is bringing to the, uh, to the table. Because the essence is that uh, for developing countries, and if we are to now bring it back to, to the continent, uh, if there's going to be uh, a hard stop from what is currently driving growth, uh, converting to green without, without paying uh, due cognizance, uh, the risk is that then the growth of Africa is going to come at a premium, whereas the traditional or developed economies have had it easy for, for decades. Uh, so there needs to be uh, at least an appreciation that uh, the whole basis of development and at least given the state of development in the continent, it still has to be driven very much by comparative advantages. In South Africa, that may be that we've got coal, in other countries, there's uh, perhaps a vast amount of land, some of which to convert to uh, arable land may mean that there's a degree of deforestation that has to be uh, accommodated. Uh, and along that, in some countries, we mean that maybe uh, land mass is not as great, uh, but there's a substantial arable land that may need to be fertilized for outcomes. Uh, you superimpose a whole notion about inter-Africa trade and the free trade agreements that are, that are emerging, and the fact that they are underpinned by import substitution programs, uh, that in essence is going to really require a high degree of industrialization. Can you industrialize with, with solar? In the immediate term, uh, I think the blatant answer is going to be no. So I think that's the context that we, as a bank, we are looking at the role that we're going to play in developing economies and the role that we're going to play in Africa as we expand. So your Part of the question was about how do we think about membership. The office that I manage out of, out of, out of South Africa is an Africa regional center. It's not a South Africa center. So, as, uh, so part of the immediate plan is to expand membership into the continent and of course into various other parts of, uh, of the world. And that's the drive essentially that, that will come through in, in, in the coming months. What is your view on the state of Africa's low carbon transition? And is there a concerted focus to ensuring that the extraordinary growth that the continent has seen uh, has a focus on sustainability? Thank you. Um, I, I don't think we can answer that question without asking, backing up and asking ourselves where exactly 
are the 54 countries of the African continent. So for instance, the country that I live in, Kenya, is one of those considered the stars of growth, growing at 6.3% last year, which is tw twice as much as global growth rates. However, in the last seven years, while it's grown at 4% and above, the, the, the share of agriculture in gross domestic product has increased from 23 to 31 this year. Now, if that's the context, and I think it's, it's the same in other places. So if that's the context, I ask myself, and one of the things that I saw is that, uh, um, let me say Kenya, and specifically African, some African countries, um, I don't use Africa as a homogeneous term. So the first thing is, uh, just to answer the question at the end, actually the picture will be mixed. To say that the whole of Africa will make that transition is a very dangerous narrative. So let me tell you why. So let's start with the fact that Kenya has 31% um, GDP growth, I mean GDP, 31% of GDP comes from agriculture. The amount of land dedicated to agriculture has been expanding. Productivity in agricultural production is falling. So what does that mean? We are using more land to produce less per inch of capital and per inch of other resources. Now that's not a sustainable one. What that will do is it'll provide the pressure because one of the things that it tells us is that African countries, and this here I can talk generically, need a structural transformation. And a structural transformation means the value that's added from, from manufacturing has to grow up. I mean, has to go up. Most of Africa's largest economies, especially the polar economies, have actually registered premature industrialization. Now, if that is where we are, let's come to the question about what does low carbon path mean? Kenya, for instance, right now, if you look at the energy mix in Kenya, it's actually mostly about 56 or close to 60% of it is from renewables. In the same time, it, at the same time, uh, in the last five years, the government of Kenya expanded electricity coverage from about 28% to upwards of 60. But you know what happened? The amount of money that was submitted to the electricity transmission company, basically, right, grew by only 3%. So you double coverage, but the income, but the income for the company grows by only 3%. So it will require subsidies. My view then is that this is not only a financial solution. In fact, a financial solution is probably naive. So if that structural transformation has to take place, I think there are countries on the African continent that can actually go on a low carbon path. There are other countries, whether by base or just the structural uh, uh, realities, will not be able to do that. And the reason I state this is because globally, we need a compact that can work for everyone. The African continent tends to be very generous and commit to very aggressive measures. The problem is demographically, most of us require jobs. And if you require jobs, one of the first things that will happen is when people get frustrated and political heat is generated, some of these plans will be abandoned. So I hope I'm not giving you the, the impression that it's not possible. It is possible. But if you look at a pin in Kenya, and if you place a pin in a few other countries, I could say, advisedly, Nigeria and all of that, that low carbon path. And the inflection point between low carbon up there is probably two decades away. Thanks. So we agreed to think about some of the solutions to these challenges. So Gwendolyn, uh, we've discussed some of the critical barriers to finance for, uh, for investments. Uh, what are some solutions that you think are viable for the African continent? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I would like to, I think it's important for us to reset um, the different points that have been raised so that we can provide our solutions properly. Like I said in the beginning, um, when a banker starts joining conversations about green growth and development, it means that the subject of green economies is no longer reserved for those in a particular sector. It impacts everybody, no matter what sector you find yourself. But for me, in looking for solutions, we first have to look at the problems or the difficulties that some of the economies in Africa will face to be able to migrate or leapfrog to these green economies. First of all, like I said, if you have countries dependent on oil and minerals for their development and growth, it's difficult to withdraw that. If you have countries where the financial sector is used to financing normal, or I'll call it basic 
um, needs of companies, it's difficult to move them to financing green initiatives. If you have communities that rely on basic natural resources, the lady who uses firewood, like in my country, to roast corn along the road, she uses the funds from that roasting, even though it's polluting the air, to send her children to school. So when you have to look at how do we leapfrog to actually look for solutions because we have to protect the environment, we have to look for renewable energy sources. But at the same time, we are faced with real realities on the ground of sustaining the economies that are poverty driven, that have lack of access to energy, have lack of access to water, and you're telling them, in spite of all these difficulties that you face, you need to go green. You're telling governments that, yes, you do have a focus on um, education and infrastructure, but you need to go green. And you're telling financial institutions that normally look at profit, not protection, that yes, you have to give your shareholders value, but you have to support the green economy. So in that mix, how do we come up with solutions that the public sector, which are the governments, and the private sector can put on the table so that all of us can work towards this green economy for sustainable development? And I would follow what um, Kwame said to say, it's not going to happen at the same rhythm in all the countries. Some countries are already ahead, if I can call it, ahead of the game. Some countries have not even started. Some countries might not be able to meet the targets that have been set of 2030 because they have more pertinent issues that they are trying to resolve right now. But if I were to give a solution, and I would go back to where I am more familiar, which is Central Africa, most of the countries in the CEMAC zone, the Gabon, Congo, Brazzaville, Cameroon, Chad, and the rest are oil dependent. They are mineral dependent. So where do we start? First thing is in partnerships, the kinds of partnerships that we are discussing. We need institutions that have the weight, the grants, as you mentioned, um, the different development banks that can say we are ready to support you and give the fundings that the governments might need, the institutions might need to be able to leapfrog and begin to make that move. We need to have institutions that can educate the communities to say yes, Going green doesn't mean this informal sector that provides you with a job or opportunity is going to disappear. It is just going to transform. There's going to be a different way of you to get your livelihood, but while protecting the economies. And a lot of investments will have to be done. The government will have to have a different focus on what they need to do to create the jobs, to alleviate the poverty, but at the same time, keep the economies green. So I think it's a series of different efforts that have to be made to be able to have that work. On the private sector, if I take the banks, what should we do in our sector to also support this leapfrog? We have started in the sense of technology going digital because most of our banking sector in our space in developing countries are very manual. They are brick and mortar banks where everybody wants a printed statement. People want to come into the bank and speak to somebody. We have to migrate them from that brick and mortar traditional banking to digital banking. It has started, but it is not at the same pace like the developed world. We are still trying to get people to use cards, we're tr still trying to get people to use electronic banking. We're still trying to get people to use ATMs. But if it succeeds, it would be the financial sector's contribution or support to migrate to the green economy because we'll be going paperless. And we'll also be increasing efficiencies because people will be able to do their banking from their home or offices or where, where, uh, where they, wherever they can. And at the same time, the job market will be transforming. Apart from employing people within the bank, you will be able to create agency banking, retail agents, and also transform the youth into digital banking. But at the same time, you still need the regulator to follow through. Because if the banking sector wants to go digital, and the regulator is saying, no, I'm scared of the mobile app, I'm scared of retail internet banking, like is the case for our regulator in CEMAC, it means that we cannot have that partnership. Because while the private sector, the banks are saying, we need to go 
um, green. The re regulator is saying, no, I want you to continue traditional banking because I'm afraid of what possibilities or um, um, evils are out there in the, the, the internet space. So I think those are the solutions that I can say um, for the public sector and the private sector, particularly the financial institutions, on how we can leapfrog um, to get to this green growth and development. Uh, you discussed the challenges and issues, particularly in the agricultural sector. Uh, what efforts on the part of the public and private sector do you think are needed to address these issues? I think first and foremost, we need to be very clear. Climate change is here and it's here to stay. And I think for Africa, we need to be very deliberate in embracing the change on our terms, rather than waiting for the change to come and overwhelm us. And I think clearly, um, even on this panel, you know, there is sort of, you know, a, a debate on really is Africa ready to, to really face the challenges of climate change. And for me, I think my position is very, very clear. We are and we must because the challenges and the impact of climate change are so overwhelming, particularly for the, for the African continent. Africa actually, you know, suffers, you know, disproportionately compared to how much we're contributing. To, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we need to be very clear and we need to be very deliberate in terms of that. I think uh, there are probably three or four main areas that we can focus on. The first and foremost, as I mentioned, is the agriculture sector because it's very clear, 80% of Africans work in the agriculture sector. 30% of the GDP of the African continent, and this is not generalizing, this is really looking at you know, all the 54 countries, comes from agriculture, so it's a quick win it is direct and it's something that we must really focus on and particularly look at solutions that are sustainable in doing so. And they're very, I mean, there are many solutions that are out there in terms of looking at climate smart agriculture, in terms of you know, looking at adaptation and mitigation measures. Closely related to that, as we move progressively into you know, some sort of agro commodity based industrialization, is really looking at how do we develop the energy sources how do we develop a renewable energy mix? Because I think it's, we're, we're well past the point where we can just put our, you know, our heads like ostriches in the sand and say, no, 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 you know, we still want to rely on coal. That's not sustainable. We must really look at how we develop an energy mix and you know, gradually and progressively balance that out. And of course, that is significant if we're really going to look at moving higher along the value chains. And of course, technology is critical in that. Um, I think public policy is very, very important. You know, these types of dialogues, I think, is really, really what embraces, you know, bringing out um, the commitment of both government and the private sector. And I think lastly, as I've mentioned before, the cost of going green is expensive. And government is not going to be able to shoulder that alone. You know, we need to bring in the private sector. It needs to be competitive. It needs to be, you know, um, realistic, really. And I think the, the development institutions, for example, the African Development Bank, and of course, you know, um, similar sister institutions, are at a vantage point, you know, in terms of being able to leverage resources and in terms of attracting the private sector in that. In the African Development Bank specifically, you know, we're setting up several programs that actually, you know, deal with that. There are large-scale um, renewable energy uh, projects that have recently gone through the bank. For example, the Lake Turkana Wind Energy Project, which is a 300 megawatt uh, wind energy farm in, in uh, Kenya. We're looking at, you know, the solar projects that we have in, in Morocco. So I think the discourse is important and I think Africa really needs to commit to this because whether we like it or not, this is a challenge that we have to deal with and this is a challenge that unlike other parts of the world, we need to develop, you know, embracing those challenges. Great, thank you. Mohua, you mentioned a couple of efforts uh, by the International Solar Alliance, including rooftop solar and capacity building. Are there other kinds of innovations and solutions that you've seen work? Yes, um, thanks for the question. Uh, I, I just wanted to come back and say, um, why is, uh, so, so now we understand the difference between um, generation and energy access. Energy access being first time energy access. So why is that important? It's important because if you think uh, of somebody who's uh, basically lighting uh, with a kerosene lamp, for example, today, if they uh, are given access to a solar lamp, then they, and they have a way of paying it off uh, within, let's say, a year, 
Then after that, they get clean light, safe light, no fire hazard, no fumes um, and health hazards, and they're not spending any more money on kerosene after a year of paying in small increments. So this is a money saver, it's a health improver, and um, so energy access is super important. Why do we think, for example, um, well, there are basically four reasons, um, and I'm not only talking about light, but um, the four reasons are improve quality of life, improve the options for productive uses. For example, even with lights and maybe solar fans and a solar powered TV, you, if you have a shop, if you have a small commercial establishment and you can stay open after dark, you can actually substantially increase your revenues. So for productive uses, in North India, there's a lot of embroidery done manually by women. Uh, once they get access to energy, these are people living in off-grid areas, once they get access to energy, they can actually take on more um, orders and they can substantially increase their family's income. Um, so access to clean lighting is very important. Lighting, fans, TVs, everything is possible now. So I just want to emphasize that the need for access to energy affects almost a billion people for first time access. And if you look at people who already supposedly have access because they have a grid connection, but it doesn't work for 18 hours a day, those are called the unreliable access people. They also need to get reliable access. We're talking about two billion, a population of two billion globally. So it's a super important issue uh, if we are going to achieve the SDGs. Energy is an SDG, it's SDG seven access to energy that should be renewable, that should be energy efficient, and so forth. So let's, let's um, I don't think it's gonna be proper to say that we can't afford it. We must afford it, we must look at ways to afford it. Um, and we must look at, you know, what's called climate justice. Let me just throw in uh, a couple of numbers here. Um, the tons of uh, emissions, pollutant emissions per capita, that is a sustainable level, is 1.5 tons per capita per year. That's the cutoff point that you can and should emit with your uh, use of energy. Um, India and Vietnam are currently actually absolutely on that figure. In India, the average energy per capita is emitting 1.5 tons of em emissions per year. Kenya is 0.3, Kenya being the star in Africa, as you said, 0.3. The United States is 16 tons. 1.5 is the cutoff point, the sustainable cutoff point. United States, all the OECD countries, Saudi Arabia, others, way, way high. Uh, so in what is uh, called climate justice, the notion, as many of us know, is that the countries which are putting out these very high levels of uh, pollutants per capita per year should actually finance uh, the need for the transition, to finance the transition for countries which are way below the sustainable level of pollutants per capita per year to reach a certain level of energy consumption that supports their development. So there's this Green Climate Fund, um, which is one of those mechanisms Right now it doesn't have enough funding uh, because certain big contributors who made pledges have pulled out at the moment. But this is an issue that needs to be resolved. The European Union is stepping in uh, and providing you know, the next round of replenishment for the Green Climate Fund, which is mostly grant funding in order to provide the blending that we were talking about earlier. But energy access is the need of the hour uh, along with improvement of energy reliability. I was talking about four things. Why is energy access important? One is to improve the quality of life. Another one is to improve opportunities for productive uses and employment opportunities. The third one is to improve the delivery of public services. In public government clinics in rural areas, government schools in rural areas, government childcare centers, imagine you have like 40 plus degrees Celsius, no light, no fan, no cooling possibility, uh, just a miserable atmosphere inside these establishments. 
And of course, in order to deliver good health services, you do need uh, energy and of course for education. So social service delivery is another very important uh, scope for energy access to improve the delivery of services. And the fourth one is public safety. You need street lights to protect particularly women at night. You need uh, other lighting in public areas. You need energy to provide public drinking water points um, to pump water and so forth. So the need for access to energy is really important to emphasize, and this is what has to be green. Let's, let's narrow down. We are not talking about painting the whole economy with a green brush. Let's focus on making energy access green. Um, again, so I have... I just, uh, so I'm just conscious of the time. Yes. And I'd like to move on and, and have the chance to quickly ask yes. some questions. Yes, I just well. want to say sure. that in... I'll just close with this thought that in addition to providing the blending uh, from the Green Climate Fund types of institutions, my idea is that we should provide, and the private sector is our friend here, the private sector knows how to provide these kinds of services, but many private sector agencies are funded by investors, commercial investors who are looking for a high commercial rate of return on capital. So a lot of the technology that is being used particularly in Africa, to deliver services, access services to remote populations, are looking for an equally high rate of return to pay their investors back. My idea is, let's use the Green Climate Fund to pay for those bills. Let people pay for the energy they consume. Let's not charge them the capital cost of the hardware that you also provide them, including all the technology overlay. That would be a very important step towards climate justice for a green energy transition in Africa. It's not fair that the last mile person should pay for the full capital cost of serving them. I'll, I'll stop there. Great, Thank you. thanks. Mola, uh, Monali, just quickly in one or two minutes, uh, can the NDB be, uh, NDB be different? And can it support entrepreneurs and SMEs in the continent that might not already be covered by other finance and development finance? Um, our mandate is a bit different uh, in, in, in that regard, in that because we operate as an infrastructure financing uh, institution, uh, unless you say uh, that we have to finance infrastructure that's sitting within SMEs, I think that, that then becomes a consideration. Uh, we see that a lot in, in, in South Africa, in fact, with the renewable energy programs, where we club uh, small uh, programs uh, to become one sizable, so we can finance either through a quindred, which is another maybe uh, national financial institution in the likes of the DBSA, the IDC. But that's how we approach and that's how we're able to access uh, SMEs. Now on the other broader discussion, uh, what, what I wanted perhaps as a takeaway that would have to emerge is a consensus uh, that I think climate change is a reality and I don't think there's any dispute on uh, on that uh, and the key central question that remains is that how do you manage the transitions and who pays for those transitions so when I give an example of what the NDB can do to contribute towards green uh, economic development broadly and one of uh, the, 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 the interventions would be at the mining sector we can finance uh, technology that contributes uh, less uh, or to the consumption of electricity uh, at the manufacturing level we can also contribute to us uh, funding technology that uses uh, less electricity, but someone pays for that. Uh, it doesn't come. Uh, it doesn't come cheap. I mean, the earlier example that I gave about uh, ESCOM, we have to build an FGD uh, retrofit technology. It's going to cost them about three billion. It doesn't add any additional uh, kilowatt of electricity. So that's a cost that the state and the state-owned entity has to um, has to stomach essentially. Uh, for for politicians, it's also the whole concept of green development. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very tricky one, because if you, if you think of it, uh, political cycles maybe may run over a five-year uh, horizon of, so, of sort. So if any mechanism that seeks to adapt or mitigate says, um, you know, have to endure less growth, uh, from a political point of view, how do you argue about the pain that is taken now for the promise of growth Beyond, beyond the horizon, you'll get penalized at the polls. 
So all of those uh, really would have to, you have to bear them in, in mind, the cost, the, the political consequence and decision making that has to be, uh, that, that, that also has to, has to go in. I think, you know, in, in, in how, we, uh, how we think of it, I think the countries that have, uh, and it's in fact unfortunate that some countries are pulling out of agreements that are long standing uh, in an era where they need to be on the table and paying for some of this because I think they've benefited a lot historically. So there must be a connection, and this will be my last point, to uh, perhaps maybe poverty outcomes um, and therefore having to differentiate which countries must go at which, uh, at what pace uh, and which countries must pay what amount uh, towards, uh, to, you know, towards any, any, any efforts. I think, I think until we come to a, a formula like that, it's always going to be the case of um, if if, I'm, uh, if I, I still believe that I've got high levels of inequality, unemployment and poverty in my country, uh, and my source of growth is, uh, is from, say, traditionally uh, emitting sources of energy, uh, how do you argue with me that I must, I must curtail? So there will always be a promise, but the delivery is always going to be low. The outcomes will forever be low because there is no proper transi transition mechanism that I've been engraved in. I promise to come back to you, but I just want to quickly uh, open it up for a couple of questions. So if anyone has a question, uh, please find your way to the mic. Let's keep it very brief. If you could just introduce yourself uh, and direct your question, uh, then I will bring it back to the panelists for one minute last thoughts. So uh, I see a lady here on the left. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Lucy from Kenya. Uh, I would like to direct my question to any of the panelists. Thank you for the session. As Moa mentioned, we don't 100% want to depend on the government. So my question is, what enablers or what plan, what support do banks or the economists have to both individuals or private sectors in investing in green growth? Like, I expect them, I expect the bank to take the lead and come up with projects to maybe give that motivations to private sectors or individuals such that we don't just wait back, but there is a support that we get or that private sectors get, especially financial support or education when it comes to the use of natural resources for sustainability. Clear? Okay, thank you. Um, I see a gentleman over here. Would you like to ask a question? Okay, thank you. Um, very quickly, it's very rare to have a range of bankers sitting all together. We mentioned here the digital access. We mentioned the energy access. I think we should also mention the banking access in Africa. Uh, if any of the countries you pick, people are challenging access to bank. If you take mine, maybe 300,000 people only have access to, to the banks in a country of 16, 16 million inhabitants. So how can the banks help citizens, uh, help the, uh, the, the youngsters, the female, to access to the system so they can elevate, they can participate in the development of our countries, not only relying uh, on, on, the, on the governments. How can you be more open to population so you can have maybe more than only 3% that have access to the banking system? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more question in the middle. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Davor Kuntz. Uh, I'm from Croatia working for the European Investment Bank Group uh, in Luxembourg. Um, I'm involved in some parts of uh, negotiations on the uh, new budget of the EU, 2021 to 27. Um, and similarly, like a number of you have uh, described, and the question is mostly for the, the representatives of the IFIs, the African Development Bank, uh, New Development Bank, but also for the others. Um, we are in a similar situation. The needs are much greater than what we have. Uh, the money that we will distribute in grants will decrease, and the emphasis will be on the financial instruments and on the continuation of the Juncker plan, right, of the budgetary guarantee of the European Union. Um, the new one will be called InvestEU. It will be 38 billion euros, which would generate 650 uh, billion in investments, the leverage that, uh, that was mentioned uh, several times today. My question is whether something similar can be done in Africa, whether you have in the IFIs uh, analyzed it, 
um, maybe not on the level of the African Union, uh, but maybe some of these regional groupings like ECOWAS and uh, Economic uh, Community of uh, Eastern Africa. It's basically pooling the resources, in our case of the member states of the European Union, for a budgetary guarantee, which then has, has mutualization of risk and in that way increases the financial uh, firepower. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, I will start with you, Kwame. If each of you can select one of the questions to answer uh, and just wrap it up in one minute and include your sort of final thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Um, my view is that there are two, there are two pro I mean, you can categorize the problems in terms of, uh, of a path to, uh, to green energy into two. There's the political problem, which I come to in a minute, uh, and the economics one. The economics one I've talked about is scale and reliability. So what this continent or many countries in this continent need will be steel, fertilizer, Electricity Bills in Kenya is a company that makes cement. It pays $340,000 $340, per month to the electricity generation company. But still, it buys its own coal. It's trying to put its own plant because its costs are too high based on the other one. It can't compete globally. So that's the, that's the economic side. So in terms of being able to scale and also to make reliable electricity. The second one is a political one. I think, wearing my hat as a student of economics, I think there are some simple ways to go about this that are not being explored because they are politically explosive. One is a carbon tax, so that the polluter pays, that money can be used to, 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 to deflect, I mean, to, to build the green energy that's required or to subsidize people who have to pay for more expensive energy. However, our government in Kenya, for instance, uses excess taxes and taxes like that just as a revenue field. So if you tell them they have to forego one and the other, it becomes a difficult political one. The final one is coming to the question which is basically is stuff rather African countries might have because of the need for scale to actually invest in common power products, mostly in uh, the grid in addition to the generation. And my thinking is, because in Kenya the most green energy source requires you to build a geothermal hole, it takes between $7 million to $18 million, and there's no guarantee that you will actually succeed. That's a really, really risky thing. It is possible for us because the Kenya government established a Kenya national um, Kenyan National Nuclear Commission, whose work is actually to assess and by the year 2030 give a report about where that country is. What I fear is the economics will be too large for an economy that is worth about $98 billion. So it's something that perhaps if East African countries can come in together and we forget our political fear about the environmental safety and all those other things, then that's possible to scale. Thanks. Great. Molali. Yes, I, I think the, the issue about you know, uh, access to finance and, and leveraging on partnership, from a development bank point of view, of the NDB point of view, uh, I mean, that, that's the direction we're going. Uh, be it we can now still hide behind the fact that we are, we are a small, uh, small institution, but over time I think those issues will, 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 will clearly be answered because they, are, they form part of our mandate. I think what I want to, to, to just you know, close with generally is that there's something that Minister uh, Sazibera said earlier on that uh, those that are looking for an Africa strategy, because there's a lot of emphasis uh, nowadays on Africa, they should also pause um, to ask about what, what is it, what, what strategy are, are the Africans themselves developing, and look to you know, borrow from that. Other than uh, over and above what the Africans are developing as a strategy, then there's other strategies that have been evolved. In, in essence, I think the Africans, uh, as Africans, we need to develop our own, our own path. There is no point in buying a Ferrari when you still have to uh, deal with issues of tarring the road. Yes. I'm going to um, address the last question, which was how do you get more mileage out of the limited and shrinking amounts of grant money that's available to the European uh, Investment Bank and to others. Uh, I think one of the ways you get more mileage uh, is by lowering the cost of uh, whatever it is that you're doing. And I think that some of the, some of the ways um, we're looking at lowering the cost is if certain uh, multilaterals did a global mapping of where are the non-grid areas uh, you can do with Google Maps and other technologies now, it's pretty uh, easy to design which areas have a small concentration of population in an off-grid area so that you can do a mini-grid versus where you have to do solar home systems for individual households. If the, that information were already provided and developers, private sector developers didn't have to spend money 
doing all that research themselves for market development, that would be one very big uh, help to lowering costs. Another one would be, which the International Solar Alliance is trying to do, is pursue economies of scale. So the International Solar Alliance is trying to look at price discovery. What if we were to you know, place an order for a million solar pump sets? And we would give assurance to the market, to the pump producers, that there will be you know, this, this amount of offtake. Will you all invest in larger production lines and can we bring the costs down that way and so forth? So economies of scale, uh, reducing information uh, costs and so forth are some ways in which uh, we can help this uh, transition to move forward. I just wanted to mention to the first question, banks are not going to do the projects. Banks will wait for somebody to put together a project and come and bring it to them for financing. I think Gwendolyn may back me up because the question was how can the banks do more renewable energy projects? I think that bank, we, we will be waiting a long time if we wait for them. We need other actors. Thanks. Great. Miriam, last thoughts? Um, I think very quickly just um, touching upon the point that we the question upon access of access to finance. I think, um, for me, it's triggered a lot of um, interesting, you know, repercussions in the sense that I think Africa is doing so well, especially in the area of access to finance. If we look at M-Pesa, we look at the the revolution that Africa is really driving through the mobile technology, and I think these are probably wins that we need to really scale up. I think these are opportunities that not only in Africa but even to other countries, you know, in other parts of the world, I think these are definitely best practices that will be adopted. And especially when we look at um, the challenge of uh, green growth and the leapfrogging that everybody keeps talking about, leapfrogging is not easy. And I don't think we can find easy solutions. I think definitely, you know, keeping the conversation open, looking at what African solutions we can develop for Africa is critical. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I would use the last two questions on the financial inclusion and the SME financing to reiterate my point I made, that going green is great. When we talk about it, it's something that sounds good, and obviously, as my colleague said, we cannot avoid it. It has to happen. But the issue to address the first question on SME financing and if banks will be able to finance the green tech First of all, the reality in most developing countries in Africa, be it Standard Chartered Bank, be it Citibank, be it Ecobank that I have worked for, when it comes to SME financing, we are very risk adverse. Why are we risk adverse? We are risk adverse because the legal system in most of those countries make it difficult for you to pursue an SME who owes you money. So most commercial banks would finance SMEs only if they have a cash collateral or if they have some kind of guarantee fund behind it like COFAS for them to finance. It's not good because normally the SMEs drive our economies, but it is our reality. That is why I say when we talk about green technology and the financing that commercial banks could give to those companies that will come up with projects because the banks will not create the projects like my colleague rightly said but are the banks ready right now to finance projects that come on that green scale for most of the countries that i have worked with worked in in west and central africa we will not finance green projects because one there will be a startup two they will need funding for the machinery for the personnel, they'll need funding from beginning to end. And most commercial banks will not be ready to do that green financing. That's why when he talked about financial inclusion, the way commercial banks in my part of Africa look at it is to say financial inclusion, because if you take the CEMAC, we are 48 million as far as population is concerned for those six countries, but less than 20% are banked less than 20% are banked. So when we talk about financial inclusion, we are looking for ways for them to have access even to the basic minimum banking 
um, um, services. And that is when mobile money and remittance products come in. And hopefully with the mobile app where people who are not in areas that have banks could be banked. So when we look at financial inclusion, we are looking at banking the unbanked population, which is a below 20% range. But now, how do you get those young adolescents, the young, the tech guys, who are coming up with fintech projects, coming up with interesting startups, they cannot be financed by commercial banks. That is where our microfinance sector has to come in. That is where the hedge funds people have to come in. That's where those who are into venture capital have to come in. And most of those players are not yet coming to our side of Africa. And this is where the opportunity lies, as I was saying. The opportunity lies in addressing those structural issues that exist. Yes, you cannot let go of your natural resources because it's a means of income. But if we have investors who are interested because we have that potential and capacity in our countries to come and put that venture capital and to have development banks backing some of those agricultural products and the, le and the rest, then we are going to see scale and we'll be able to leapfrog. But it would happen separately and at different levels between the various countries in the, 50, in the 54 countries that we have in Africa. It will not happen at the same time, but if we go geographical specific on strategy, we will get there. Thank you, Gwendolyn. And thank you to the panelists. I'm conscious that I am keeping everyone from their dinners, so I'll just wrap it up very quickly. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your insights, and I know that there are conversations that can come out of this after dinner and in the coming days, so thank you all very much.